Welcome to The Bo Show. Recently I attended Freedom Fest out in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is a libertarian conference of sorts. And I say of sorts because it's not only libertarian with a capital L, but it can be libertarian with a small l, meaning there is a libertarian exchange of ideas that might bleed through several different political parties, including the Republican, Democrat, and Libertarian parties. These folks tend to go issue by issue rather than a whole platform that one must subscribe to. But in the end, they all want the same thing, freedom. And that means economic freedom, religious freedom, and personal freedom. The freedom to worship or the freedom not to worship. And while Libertarian candidates have not fared very well when it comes to presidential elections in our two-party system, many of the ideas that are exchanged find their ways to different candidates and platforms. Senator Rand Paul, for instance, is a very pro-liberty senator, which comes from his libertarian father, Congressman Ron Paul. But the conference also had speakers such as former Democrat Andrew Yang, who has started a new political party. And as I listened to various panels and breakout sessions, it seemed clear that they wanted to address issues like our ailing economy, inflation, bad tax policy, and what the lockdowns did to us, and how negatively it impacted this country. And of the rights that our Constitution grants us, I would say that Amendments 1 and 2 are likely the most important to them. The First Amendment, so that we are guaranteed our right to speech, expression, and assembly, since Freedom Fest is an exchange of some very diverse views. But also the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. I saw many attendees with shirts that made this quite apparent. And compared to the Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC for short, I'd be willing to say that there were more Second Amendment advocates at Freedom Fest than at CPAC. As such, I interviewed Maj Touré, who wears just such a shirt, which reads, Black Guns Matter. This is clearly an affront to the previously coined Black Lives Matter movement, which started a big conversation about police brutality, crime, and the right to bear arms itself. Maj's roots are in Philadelphia, and when you see this interview, you will quickly discern that he's intelligent, passionate, and has thought long and hard about his philosophy on gun rights and how it ties directly to what the Constitution spelled out. Maj teaches firearm safety as well as conflict resolution in communities because that's where he sees the real problem, not the gun itself, but education. With a number of mass shootings as well as your everyday homicide in Chicago, I wanted to pick his brain on what's the real heart of the problem and why the media tends to cherry pick the violence it wants to showcase. I guarantee you that you will hear a whole perspective that you have likely never thought about before. Here's my sit down with Maj Touré. Maj Touré of Black Guns Matter, thank you so much for joining uh, me today here at Freedom Fest. Yep. It's a libertarian festival, so a lot of exchange of ideas. Yep. Maj, you were a Philly hip hop artist, but at some point you founded Black Guns Matter. Tell me your story in Philly and how you came to establish Black Guns Matter. Well, when you start traveling as an independent artist, you make relationships with people. I, I would go to New York, I would go to Chicago, I would go to Detroit, LA, selling, I'm going to sell 500 CDs here and come back. You develop these relationships. You go back to the city the next, you know, six, seven months, whatever. And one of the guys is, hey, where's Steve? Oh, he caught a gun charge. Who'd he shoot? Who'd he rob? He didn't shoot or rob anybody. He just had the gun. Yeah. Then you go to Detroit. Same thing. Yo, where's Rob? Oh, he, he caught a gun charge. Well, who'd he shoot? Who did he rob? Nobody. He just had a gun. That, then you start to see this is a highly organized phenomenon. The attack on the people to keep and bear arms, even though the Second Amendment is clear, because of lack of information, because of whatever, unconstitutional statutes, there needed to be some information to push back against that. So what we started to do was just do clashes. Can we tell people, you know, how to be safe and responsible firearms owners as well as, can we show them how the rules are unconstitutional, these statutes in their neighborhood, and while we're getting them to be safe and responsible firearms owner, owners, can we also get them to be politically active wherever they land on the spectrum? Can we at least get them to be politically active to overturn those unconstitutional statutes? All right, Samaj, so parts of Philly are pretty rough, and I'm from Memphis parts. Memphis are very rough. Um, we've seen a spate of gun-related crimes all over the place from Uvalde to everyday occurrences in Chicago. What do you see as the core issue in this? The core issue is the lack of understanding of what safe and responsible firearms ownership is, as well as a complete 
disrespect for the Second Amendment. And what I mean by that is, if you're in a state that notoriously has uh, violated the supreme law of the land as it relates to the Second Amendment, and you create these unconstitutional statutes, you can't make a lesser state, you know, the Supreme Court being the supreme law, you're making a state law that attempts to supersede that federal law, that human right, you know, Constitution and Bill of Rights. So when you do that in a certain city and or state, there's no education around that concept. There's no education around safe and responsible firearms ownership. And if I'm the bad guy, oh, I know that you can't have a firearm lawfully. I'm going to rob you. So now the states that have more of those restrictions has less education. And then you have more of, let's say, the same thousand bad guys doing the bad things. And they're, the regular citizens are now hamstring between the unconstitutional statutes that the state presents while those politicians have armed details mm -hmm. and the bad guys that know that they can't carry a firearm. So that's the weird juxtaposition that these politicians are putting everyday American citizens in. And it's primarily in these same, you know, blue cities and states. Yeah. And I don't say that to be disrespectful to people that happen to be Democrat in these cities and states. They are under a matrix, for lack of a better term, that tells them that you don't have the right to defend yourself. And then when you double that down with the civics being ripped from the school, they don't understand the civic process. So now we don't get to say, hey, we actually do have a human right to defend ourselves. Maybe in the rest of the state, perfect example is where I live in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is anti-gun. Blue city in the middle of a red state, Pennsylvania. Yeah. So these cities have the most violent crime, even though there's guns in all of the other cities around those same red states. Seems counterintuitive. It's absolutely counterintuitive. So how do you feel then about background checks, especially for those under 21? And yeah. do you see any problem at all yeah. with a person being able to buy a military-grade rifle that can fire multiple magazines rapidly? So one, every gun, say a semi-automatic firearm. I got a semi-automatic pistol on me right now. Everybody around me is super safe. If it was you're a handling responsible, because I'm a safe and responsible firearms owner. If we educate people to have those and, and, and turn those people into protectors of the people, which is generally what training does. You know how many boxers walk away from fights? I know what I'm capable of doing and you don't train and it's not even a fair fight. It's okay, bro. I don't want the case. I want to protect life. That's what training does. Okay. When we start to attempt to limit the type of firearm that the American citizens are allowed to have, one, we spit in the face of the founding documents of this place. Two, then you have to start, if, if you want to be intellectually consistent, you then have to say, well, if I don't have the Second Amendment, well, your freedom of speech, your First Amendment right, people can say mean things and they should be put in jail. So if we're going to be intellectually consistent, when we start curtailing the type of firearms, and for these reasons, we got to be intellectually consistent all across the board. Either we are in, all in on this freedom thing, and struggle around the... the you don't the, want to piecemeal it. Right. So what, what, why do you think so many mass shooters, Maj, are young males in their late teens? And do you see over-medication or a lack of medication as a contributing factor? So here's the irony of that. The average age of mass shooters in America is 33. Okay. So even if we made the rule you got to be 21, the average age of mass shooters is 33. That doesn't solve the problem. And then if we make rules to isolate to say, hey, we, you can't have a firearm in here. Well, that's why this weirdo at you, uh, in Buffalo did it. He literally wrote this so-called manifesto saying, I'm going here because they can't defend themselves and I want to kill the black people. So why... Well, we advocate for more restrictions that only makes those people not have the means to stop that bad guy. So when it's a 21 and over thing, are we also being intellectually consistent and in saying, okay, well, now you can't go into the military until you're 21. Okay, now you can't vote until you're 21. These same people that advocate for this, saying you got to be 21 to buy a rifle, are now saying you, gotta, you should be able to be 16 to vote. So yeah. the intellectual inconsistency, that's the real pandemic. And I just ask these questions to people. Are you recognizing where you're being inconsistent? And I can always double down on that's not the framework of this place. Now, you have the right as a human. If you don't like how we're struggling with this issue around firearms, you don't like it. Canada is right up the street. <laughs> no one's going to argue. You literally as in the greatest era that we are living in in world history we have the right to say i want to drive on up to canada i don't like this firearm thing 
and we're going to solve that problem right there. And I will respect your choice, respect your freedom, and let us as the Ameri the actual Americans, right, that understand freedom, let us struggle with that issue, and you don't have to be a part of it. How do you feel about social media companies who may have been privy mm -hmm. to what some of these shooters would do before they did it? Is there any responsibility there? No. On their part? There's no responsibility to their part. They are responsible for curtailing the speech of people that would say, hey, this is a problem. But it's not their responsibility to jump in. So if I say, if I go on Facebook right now, so I don't like Maj Ture. Yeah. I don't want to kill him. Yeah. And I'm going to kill him. Okay. They have no, they should not report any of that to police to say, this guy might be off his rocker. He's about to go kill a guy. I think the general public, one, if a guy says, I don't like Maj Ture and I want to kill Maj Ture, Maj Ture tweets his exact location. And I'm saying freedom isn't safe. And if you want to do that, Bruce Lee said one time, if someone in a fight, a man has decided that he's going to bite your nose off, you're going to have a rough time with that guy that's committed. I do not want to sacrifice my freedom to exist and move about freely for this false sense of security. Now, do I think that other people that see that can choose to say, hey, that's not right? But, and, and, and absolutely. And then guys can reach out and say, hey, brother, is everything okay? Why do you want to kill Maj Toure? Mm -hmm. I've even said, hey, man, you disagree with me. Let's meet. I've done this in real life. Hey, man, I see you said this about me. You live in Philadelphia, too. Let's meet at the cafe and let's have coffee. I've done that. Yeah. And after that conversation, this guy was like, man, I was completely wrong about you. I think the problem that we're outsourcing not only all of our security to just the state, but we're outsourcing it saying that Facebook has to be our big daddy mm. and it's wrong now do I think that a citizen sees that that cares about me and says hey Maj I, I gotta tell somebody that this guy's trying to kill you he's gonna have a hard time very hard to kill I'm very hard to kill <laughs> now I respect his right to say it 